Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Asma Nore, and I'm a grants program specialist with the Training and Technical Assistance Unit here at the Office on Violence Against Women, or OVW. I'm also joined by Alanda Thomas from the Grants Financial Management Division and Marnie Shields, Attorney Advisor. Today, we'll be discussing the fiscal year 2024 solicitation for the Resource Center on Workplace Responses to Assist Victims of Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. For simplicity, I'll be referring to the program as just the Resource Center for the remainder of the presentation. Because we don't have time to cover every section of the solicitation in detail, I'll be focusing just on key specific sections and also opening up the conversation for questions at the end. I recommend having the solicitation open with you as we go throughout the webinar so that you can follow on the sections that I'm referring to. The goal of the Resource Center is to provide information and assistance to employers, labor organizations, and victim service providers to aid in their efforts to develop and implement workplace responses to assist victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking, and sexual harassment. The Resource Center also aims to reach a variety of different types of employers with technical assistance and training resources. And that includes private companies, federal agencies, public entities, such as public institutions of higher education and state and local governments. Some examples of what the Resource Center can provide are training to promote a better understanding of workplace assistance, uh, conferences and other educational opportunities, and developing protocols and model workplace policies that employers can use. As a result of the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization in 2022, we have several key points to highlight in terms of changes to the Resource Center program. These changes have not yet been implemented. Firstly, the reauthorization required a focus on outreach to employers with fewer than 20 employees. And as part of that, uh, there will be a requirement to develop a website that will provide resources specific to those employers with less than 20 employees. Also, while the program has focused on sexual harassment in the past, this was made a more specific focus of the Resource Center more recently, and applicants should aim to highlight explicitly how they would address sexual harassment within their proposal. And lastly, the Resource Center will now include a Pathways to Opportunity pilot program. And the goal of this is to support survivors who are seeking employment. This pilot program would focus on building collaborations between victim service providers, workplace development programs, and other educational and vocational institutions so that they can help survivors in seeking employment. The pilot program should also be centered around serving traditionally marginalized groups and culturally specific organizations. Now that we've gone through an overview of the program, I'll be discussing how to apply and key components of the application process. The application process is a two-step process, so that's very important to keep in mind. First, applicants will complete standard forms in grants.gov, and the deadline for that is Tuesday, December 10th. And then the remainder of the application would be completed in the Just Grant system by Thursday, December 12th at 8.59 p.m. Eastern. 
Grants.gov includes the SF-424 and the SF-LLL. These are standard forms that I'll be describing a little bit more in detail later in the presentation. And once that component of the application is submitted, the applicant will receive an automatic email from Just Grants instructing them to continue the remainder of the application within Just Grants. We highly recommend submitting all required documents no later than 24 to 48 hours before each individual deadline. We have unfortunately seen many applicants that wait until the last few hours to begin uploading and then end up running out of time. Some other things to keep in mind, once you click submit on Just Grants, you'll no longer be able to add any documents to your application. This means that if you forgot to upload a required document, you'll need to start all the way from the beginning and complete the grants.gov submission again. But that's only possible if the grants.gov deadline has not passed. So please make sure that you don't press the submit button in Just Grants until you're 100% positive, you're, you're, all the documents you've uploaded are correct and all the required information is there. OVW will not alert you if there are documents missing in your application. And just to help out timing wise, we've also provided some suggested dates for completing registration in SAM.gov and grants.gov. Um, so please aim to register in both of those by November 19th. Lack of registration or not renewing your registration on SAM or grants.gov will not be considered a valid reason to request late submission. This slide provides some general information and resources for submitting your application within both the grants.gov and just grants systems. We have several trainings and job aids that you can refer to as you're navigating the application. So please make sure to take advantage of these and reach out to us if you have any questions. Moving on to award period and amounts, this program will fund one award of up to $1,850,000 for a period of performance of 24 months. The award period would begin on February 1st, 2025. One thing to note is that OVW does have the discretion to make awards for greater or lesser amounts than the 1.85 million indicated in the solicitation or the amount requested by the applicant. And we also have the discretion to negotiate the scope of work and budget with applicants before making an award or after an award is made, but prior to access of funds. Applicants should also be realistic of how much funding they actually need to accomplish their project. So for example, if an applicant needs 1.5 million based on the activities that they're proposing, they should apply for that amount rather than increasing the amount to meet the 1.85 million cap. Eligible applicants for this program are nonprofit, non governmental entities or tribal organizations in the United States or US territories. Faith based and community organizations, including culturally specific organizations, tribal organizations, and population specific organizations can also apply. Eligible applicants should also be able to demonstrate their expertise in operating a national resource center and specifically in developing workplace responses to assist victims of domestic violence and sexual violence. A letter of intent for this program is not required but is highly recommended. The letter of intent is very brief. It just lets us know that you're planning on applying and it should state that the organization is registered and current with SAM.gov and grants.gov. We do have a sample on our website for you to follow. 
applicants that do not submit a letter of intent are still eligible to apply and applicants that submit a letter are not obligated to move forward with the remainder of the application if they end up changing their mind. It does help the TA unit a lot when you do submit a letter of intent um, so that we can estimate how many applications we're receiving. And it also ensures that applicants are well positioned to successfully submit their applications by the deadline. So the letter of intent is due by Tuesday, November 26, and you'll just email that to the TA email address, which is ovw.techassistance at usdoj.gov. A few notes on formatting requirements for this application. Applications should be double-spaced with one-inch margins, aerial font no smaller than 11 points, and a maximum of 25 pages for the proposal narrative. Headings and subheadings should also be incorporated into the application, and it should be corresponding to the specific sections identified in the solicitation. Keep in mind that applicants can lose some points for failing to adhere to the formatting requirements, um, so just be careful to follow these. Moving on to the application components, you can think of the application components in three categories, standard forms, score documents, and additional data. The standard forms are submitted first in grants.gov, as I mentioned earlier, so that includes the SF-424 and the SF-LLL. The scored documents are submitted on just grants, and that includes the project narrative, budget detail worksheet and narrative, letter of commitment, and letter of support. Applications that do not include all four of these documents would be deemed incomplete and not considered for funding. Each applicant will also be required to complete three unscored surveys in just grants, and that includes the pre-award risk assessment, the applicant entity questionnaire, and the summary data sheet. For the standard forms, the SF-424 is the application for federal assistance, and the SF-LLL is the disclosure of lobbying activities, and these are generated within grants.gov. These forms cover basic information about your organization, entity type, amount of funding you're applying for, and information about your organization's lobbying activities. A couple of things to know are that estimated funding amount, the estimated funding amount that you list in the SF-424 has to match the budget that you submit later on in just grants. And also TA does not use match funds. So as you're filling out the SF-424, please do not include match funds. Applicants are also required to submit a brief abstract, and this is part of the Just Grant system. Um, so you'll see a text box where you can submit a short abstract. This is not scored, but is re reviewed throughout the application review process. Please only submit the abstract in the text box. You do not need to upload a separate attachment. And applicants are highly encouraged to follow the template in the solicitation on how to write the abstract. Um, and please do not just summarize past accomplishments. It's more a summary of what you're planning to propose as part of the proposed project. In the next couple of slides, we're going to focus on aspects of your application that relate to documents that are financial team reviews. So now I'll pass it pass the presentation on to my colleague Alanda Thomas to cover this section. Thanks, Arva. 
In the next couple of slides, we are going to focus on aspects of your application that relate to the documents that our financial team, the Grants Financial Management Division, GSMD, reviews. More specifically, we'll discuss some items that GSMD has identified from prior years applications that could help with expediting our review process. So for today, we're going to highlight certain aspects of the pre-award risk assessment and provide you with a link to detail to a detailed webinar on how to develop the budget that will be included in your application. First, we'll highlight the items identified in the data summary data sheet, which is completed by all applicants. Specifically, two items that we would like to discuss are the single audit response and the IRS three-step safe harbor procedure. OBW requests that all applicants provide a statement as to whether they have expended $750,000 or more in federal funds during their last fiscal year. If they have, then they indicate that and also specify the end date of their last fiscal year. However, GFMD is finding that applicants do not always include all of this information. Please ensure that this question is answered in its entirety on the summary data sheet, question number three. Another item that we'd like to highlight from the solicitation is specifically for nonprofit organizations. If you use the IRS three-step safe harbor procedure to determine your executive's compensa compensation, you are required to provide a disclosure letter. Please refer to the solicitation for further details and a link to a sample letter. Note that there are four required parts of this disclosure letter. The sample letter provided outlines all four parts of the disclosure, so please be sure to follow the sample and provide a response to each of the four pieces. The next item that we'd like to discuss is the pre-award risk assessment question which assists GFMD during their pre-award risk assessment review for all applications. Each applicant must prepare a response to all 11 questions, and each question has multiple parts. We've noticed from prior years that applicants do not always fully answer all parts of the question, which in turn requires GFMD to reach out to the applicant and which may delay funding decisions. Some of the most common issues that we've encountered have been, for example, question number two, where the applicant indicates that they do indeed have internal policies, but they don't provide a pre brief list of topics covered in the policies and procedures. On question number three, some applicants fail to provide a brief summary of the organization's process for tracking expenditures, and more specifically, whether or not it tracks budgeted versus actual expenditures. These are just a few examples, but in general, please make sure that you read each piece of your, each question and provide a full and comprehensive response. This slide quickly highlights some resources that are available as you are creating the budget, the budget to be submitted with your application. Over the last couple of years, GFMD has developed a detailed webinar presentation on how to develop a budget to be submitted with the OVW application. This presentation addresses some of the challenges that may, you may face with your budget and provides some insight on OVW's budget review process. This webinar can be found at the link on this slide. Next up is the uniform guidance, which can be found at 2 CFR 200. Use your favorite search engine for this one. Other resources include the DOJ financial guide and the solicitation itself. Again, we know that this can be a lot of information to process. So if you have any questions about the GFMD information discussed, please feel free to contact the GFMD help desk at 1-888-514-8556 or by email at ovw.gfmd at usdoj.gov 
I would recommend emailing. You would get a faster response be because we have associates on hand that can help you and provide a wealth of knowledge um, and answers to your question. Thank you so much, Alanda. And I just want to say again that our GFMD team is very knowledgeable, very helpful and responsive. So please don't hesitate to reach out to them if you have questions on any of the components she discussed today. I will now move on to discussing more details about the scored components of the application. And I'll start by going over the project narrative which includes the purpose of the proposal section worth 20 points, the what will be done section worth 30 points, and who will implement the project, which is worth 15 points. The, the solicitation lists in more detail which criteria an application should respond to for each section. So please make sure to address all of those criteria because they correspond directly to how the reviewers will be scoring your application. For the what will be done section, you must provide a clear link between the proposed activities and the need you've identified in the purpose of the proposal section. One question that we receive pretty frequently is what types of TA delivery methods should an applicant propose for this project? The delivery methods really depend on which goals and objectives you've proposed within the application. And as stated in the criteria in the what will be done section, applicants should clearly explain why they're choosing a particular training or technical assistance delivery method, why it's appropriate for the target audience, and also the applicant's experience with that specific delivery method. I also want to draw your attention to the criteria regarding accessibility. All training and technical assistance provided must be responsive to individuals with disabilities, individuals that are hard of hearing or deaf or limited English proficient. Applicants must also submit a project timeline as part of the what will be done section the timeline should be included in the body of the project narrative and should not be a separate attachment. If the timeline is attached as a separate document, it would count towards the page limit for the project narrative, which again is maximum of 25 pages. And if your narrative is already at that maximum, the timeline would not be reviewed. Please do not include attachments that are not required for the application and also refrain from including any photos or images in the project narrative. If you have any charts, they can be single space, but you still have to follow the font and spacing requirements outlined in the formatting section. Moving on to the budget, which is worth 15 points. Um, keep in mind that we're not using the Just Grants web-based budget this year, so you will submit your budget detail worksheet and narrative as separate attachments in Just Grants. Make sure that you've carefully considered the resources that you need to implement your proposed project and activities. If you don't need the full budget cap that we've outlined do not apply for the full cap and vice versa. Make sure that you are proposing enough funding for the activities that you're proposing. OVW does have the discretion again to make awards for greater or lesser amounts than requested and also to negotiate the scope of work with you later on. The cost of the budget should correlate directly with what is being proposed in the project narrative, and there should be a clear link between those two sections. For example, if the budget includes an in-person training, we should also see that in-person training described in detail in your project narrative section. For staffing, if you listed a position in the budget, you should be discussing that position also in the project narrative. 
the first time we see a position or an individual mentioned should not be in the budget. Also, accessibility considerations that I mentioned earlier should be incorporated into the budget. For example, expenses for translation of materials, interpreters, captioning, et cetera, should be included and be reasonable to what's being proposed in the what will be done section. Hey, Asma, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there is a question. And um, okay. so I wanted to pose you the question. The person says, sure. I see that photos or other images are not permitted in the narrative. Can the title page include a graphic and also are visuals like flowcharts considered an image or not? I would not recommend having any photos in the cover page either. Neelam, do you have any guidance on flowcharts? Um, yes. Hi, everyone. Neil Patel, team lead for training technical assistance. Um, just what Asma said, you don't want to, your cover page is not counted as a page, but just keep in mind, we don't require it. It's a photo. Flowcharts are allowable um, as charts are allowable in your uh, narrative. However, we ask for them to be minimal and to also not um, just solely be about the flowchart. We are asking for the details for each of the criteria to be spelled forth and listed in the narrative. But you can include flowcharts as well or a chart if necessary. Thank you. Couple of other points on the budget for in-person meetings. If you're proposing those, please review the conference planning and expenditure limits sections in the solicitation and make sure your budget follows those guidelines. One key point I wanted to point out is that there are restrictions on food and beverage costs for in-person events. And you'll see several other guidelines on conference planning. Um, so please be, make sure to refer to those. And lastly, the Resource Center does require applicants to budget for the hiring of a new staff member. And this person would be required to dedicate at least 75% of their effort to the imp implementation of the Pathways to Opportunity pilot program. Some unallowable costs for this program are lobbying, fundraising, any purchase of real property, physical mod modifications to buildings, including minor re renovations. That would include things like painting or carpeting, construction, and also subawards to pilot sites. Research projects, direct victim services, and surveys are also um, out of scope for this program. The only exception is that 2% of your funds can be allocated to conduct an assessment for internal improvement of purposes only. So assessments that uh, review how well your trainings are going, things like that. Some additional program requirements to keep in mind as you're crafting your project narrative and budget are all applicants need to include funds to attend OVW sponsored training and meetings throughout the project period. This funding allocation is required for all applicants, even if you're based in the DC area. Recipients are also required to collect and report on performance indicators to show their progress throughout the project. All the forms, instructions, trainings, and related tools for these uh, performance indicators are available on the OVW website on, or I'm sorry, on the VAWA Measuring Effectiveness Initiative webpage. And there are guidelines specific to each OVW program. Recipients are also required to participate in any assessment or evaluation that OVW may conduct during the project period. And since this is a new component, I also wanted to highlight again the 
requirement to hire a project coordinator for the Pathways to Opportunity pilot project. Lastly, recipients must include a planning period with their OVW program specialists and any project partners that they're collaborating with. The next scored component of the application is the letter of commitment, which is worth 15 points. The letter should identify partners and provide a brief history of their collaborative relationship. It should describe the roles and responsibilities each partner will assume and state that each project partner has reviewed the budget. The letter of commitment should also describe the resources and expertise each partner would contribute to the project and specify the extent of their participation in developing the application. Please also identify all key personnel within the letter of commitment and include signatures from all partners. If you have multiple signature pages, make sure that all names of signatories are typed on each page. And the letter of commitment should be a single document with all partners. Please do not submit um, separate letter of commitments. Additional letters of commitment that are submitted will not be scored. And there's a typo on this slide. The Wherever it says MOU, it should say letter of commitment. worth five points. The letter should be written by the organization. Um, they, they should identify the purpose of the training or technical assistance they received from the applicant and include the date that that technical assistance was provided. And the, the letter of support should discuss the extent to which the training or training enhancing the organization a workplace responses to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and sexual harassment. Only one letter of support is required. Keep in mind that you won't get extra points for additional letters. Some additional application components that are not scored but embedded within the Just Grants application process are the non-supplanting letter, confidentiality notice form, and the summary of other federal funding. The summary of other federal funding would include current and recent OVW awards, as well as any other federal grants you have received or submitted applications for to do similar work. And samples of these charts are available on the OVW website. As a reminder, SAM.gov registration to receive a UEI can take an average of two to three weeks and grants.gov registration can take an average of one week. So it's really important to start in advance, well in advance of the application deadlines. The Just Grants registration needs to, be, needs to be completed only after submission of the grants.gov components, which include the application of federal assistance and the disclosure of lobbying activities. If you encounter any difficulties with SAM, grants.gov, or Just Grants, the email addresses for tech support for all three systems are listed at the end of this presentation. There are very limited circumstances where you can submit late, you can request late submission of your application due to inclement weather or technical difficulties. Please read the section of the solicitation that discusses this to fully understand 
the circumstances where you can request this and the very specific steps you would need to follow to request late submission. Any applicant requesting a late submission must follow the instructions in the solicitation. Um, and that includes requests due to severe weather, natural disaster, or technical difficulties beyond the applicant's reasonable control. Missing the grants gov deadline or just grants deadline is not considered a technical issue that qualifies for late submission. Failure to begin the registration and the application submission in submission insufficient time or having the not having the correct version of Adobe is also not an acceptable reason for late submission. We have seen this many times where applicants are not able to submit their application because they don't have the correct version of Adobe and unfortunately waited until it was too late to be able to access that. The next two slides are reminders on how to address technical issues, and there are more details on this in the solicitation as well. Um, some key points to keep in mind, you must have documentation of any issues with grants.gov, your SAM registration, or just grants, and you should contact the OVW technical assistance email address as soon as you're aware of those issues and provide us with the documentation of the issue and also your efforts to resolve them by contacting the relevant help desks. Once the grants.gov deadline passes, an applicant that has not completed their submission will not be able to submit in just grants. This slide discusses technical issues for just grants. Again, the most important thing to remember is please maintain any documentation of issues and communications with the OVW Just Grants help desk and follow the instructions listed in the solicitation if you encounter technical issues. Communication to resolve issues should start well in advance of the deadline to show that you didn't wait until the last minute. And please note that it's not guaranteed that applications submitted via email due to technical issues will be accepted for funding. To make sure you complete the steps required in grants.gov and that your application is su successfully submitted in just grants, it's recommended that all applicants begin the submission process 48 hours prior to each deadline and at least no later than 24 hours from the deadline for each step. Please do not submit test applications to see if grants.gov or just grants are actually working. All applications submitted, even if they're complete, are considered an application submission and will be reviewed accordingly. And also please avoid submitting one application multiple times. The most recently submitted application is the one that would be reviewed. Some other reminders for just grants. Um, when you're submitting your application, you'll be entering specific components directly into just grants, like the abstract, or you'll be required to upload the attachments to just grants, for example, the budget detail and worksheet. When submitting your application in Just Grants, you can save your progress in the system and revise the application as needed uh, prior to hitting the submit button. Don't hit the submit button until you're done with the application and ready to submit the full application. The application submitter, entity administrator, and authorized representatives will receive an email from Just Grants confirming submission. Please make sure that these individuals whose emails are connected with the application are regularly checking their email for the confirmation of submission. OVW will not provide confirmation that applications were received. 
In the past, unfortunately, we've had situations where executive directors assign the responsibility for uploading to an assistant who is not checking their emails after they submit, and then they realize too late that the deadline has passed and that the application didn't go through. And also we've seen executive directors upload the application themselves, leave for travel or other duties, and then fail to check their email to confirm that the application went through correctly. So just note that everyone whose email is attached to the application has a responsibility to maintain communication and ensure that they receive application that the receive confirmation that the application was submitted correctly. And one last reminder, OVW can see in Just Grants when an applicant started to upload their application. Um, and we've had applicants in the past state that they had technical issues, but we can see that um, they started the process, for example, an hour or even less before the deadline and they ended up running out of time rather than actually having technical issues. Some final reminders, please read the solicitation thoroughly. thoroughly. Again, uh, this webinar was just an overview um, and we recommend that you clearly and carefully read each component of the solicitation so that you're aware of all the requirements. Double check all your attachments before uploading and label them accordingly in Just Grants. Do not submit multiple versions of the same application and please start uploading at least 48 hours from the due date and time. Going over the deadlines one more time, there are multiple steps to the application process and um, we've provided um, the suggested deadline for SAM and grants.gov to help with this process. So uh, the SAM and grants.gov registration is deadline is Tuesday, November 19th. Um, the grants.gov deadline is Tuesday, December 10th. And just grants deadline is Thursday, December 12th. And again, the optional but highly recommended letter of intent is due Tuesday, November 26th. Feel free to contact OVW at any point if you're having difficulties or if you have questions. Um, there is a help desk associated with each of the different systems you'll be using to submit the application. Um, so you can contact the help desk at grants.gov or just grants for technical issues. For programmatic questions, please contact ovw.techassistance. And then for financial questions, please contact GFMD directly at ovw.gfmd at usdoj.gov. And we've now made it to the Q&A section of the presentation. Uh, please feel free to submit your question in the chat box and we'll be happy to address it. And Mello or Marnie, if you could read any questions for me, that would be very helpful. Yes, will do. As of this moment, there are not any open questions. Um, so folks, please, if you have any other questions, you can type them in the Q&A now. And um, then otherwise there's that TA email address that you can send additional questions to. If you think of some later, there's a question now in the chat. Will there be a copy of the recording sent? Um, we will post it on our website, I believe. Yes, our contracting team will be editing the presentation and script and posting those on our website.
Still no questions in the Q and A. We can so, stay on a few more minutes and then log off. Oh, there is a question now. I wanted to double check that my read of the solicitation is correct in that the new pathways to economic opportunity entails connections to victim service providers and workforce development programs that already run such programs. There will be no additional funding for new programs to start. Is that correct? Marnie, did you want to answer that? Yes, I am happy to do so. Um, give me a second. I'm finding that page of the statute. So you're you're exactly right. The idea is building collaborations um, to better serve victims, basically. So it's not for developing new things. It's about developing collaborations, but not new programs. Still no questions. I'll wait till one fifty-five to see if there's anything. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, I think we're good. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you to my co-facilitators, Alanda and Marnie, to our Lidos contracting team. And also thank you to our ASL interpreters and tech support. And please feel free to reach out to us again at any point if you have questions as you're developing your application and we look forward to reading your applications. Thank you.